Thank you, Alan, for that generous introduction. Welcome, everyone. You're going to have an exciting afternoon. The first half, you'll hear several topics on the theme of what's the minimum that gives you the maximum? What's the least effort that pays off the best? And you'll learn about how to manage stress, uh, the importance of exercise in uh, older adults, anxiety in children, and a remarkable case of someone who had major trauma and made a full recovery. The second half, you'll be hearing about the awake and sleeping brain and the amazing powers of the brain. Now, when we think about being brainy, we usually think about the Einsteins of this world. But think of a hockey player making split-second decisions. Think of a simultaneous translator, impressive performances. And think of an opera singer. They sing, they act, and they interact all at the same time. Now, we all have amazing brains, but there's an insidious threat. The older we get, the more likely you are, we are to get a stroke, suffer heart disease, or the tragedy of dementia. So what are we doing about it? Well, we've done quite well, actually, with heart disease. We're doing reasonably well with stroke, but how about dementia? The bulk of the effort, the bulk of the funds, the bulk of the activity is finding a drug that will slow Alzheimer's disease. Now we have two. Neither is powerful enough or affordable enough to make a difference. A more promising approach is one that was pioneered by Mia Kivipelto. And what she did was identify individuals at risk of developing dementia and then randomize them to usual care compared to intensive lifestyle changes. So they had coaches for exercise, nutritionists, advice on diet. They got together uh, socially, and also they did brain exercises. And at the end of the study, it was shown that it did slow progression to dementia. However, neither the bulk of the efforts to prevent dementia by investing in drugs, nor the promising approach of Dr. Kivipelto is going to make a big difference. And the reason is that we cannot just simply target people who already have some symptoms, because the next wave of younger people will be even larger than the rest, because we, the world is aging. The average life expectancy in Canada is now 84. Moreover, the, there are more people over 65, they're children over 14. So unless we invest in brain health for everyone, we'll never catch up with these waves of stroke and dementia and heart disease. So what is brain health? There are many definitions, but essentially when neurologists talk about brain health, they're talking about the absence of neurological disease. When psychiatrists talk about mental health, they talk about behavior, as if it had nothing to do with the brain. And neither the people interested in physical brain health or mental health have taken into account the importance of social health. Now we know that social isolation can literally shrink your brain. In the pandemic, we discovered how closely they are linked. If your brain was befogged by COVID, you didn't feel well, you didn't want to connect with people. If you were anxious or lost a loved one in the pandemic, you were anxious and depressed and you couldn't perform well and you certainly didn't feel like socializing. And we all learned, however solitary we think we are, the importance of connecting to other people. And so once free to mingle with others, it was a delight. So we need to know what brain health means. So one way of actually conveying this is to start talking about holistic brain health. And the definition that everyone can understand is when you're thinking, you're feeling, and you're connecting with others is the best it can be. But let's remember that 
brain health does not happen in isolation. And the World Health Organization has put forth a document, and they talk about five determinants of brain health. One is physical health, the other one is safety, the third one is a healthy environment, the fourth one is learning and connecting, and the last one is access to quality services. So we are proposing that we can put that all in one sentence so we know that we have to look at all of them together. Because the brain is the source of many of our troubles, but ultimately the only source of potential solutions. So the definition that we are proposing is holistic brain health is a state of optimal cerebral, mental, and social well-being in a safe, healthy, and supportive environment. So how do we get there? Well, we, I think if we are to succeed, we have to begin in a group that's likely to change. Nobody likes change. Most people are not following a healthy lifestyle. It's simply too difficult. So who is likely to change? Well, you know, there are three times in your life when you're more likely to change than others. When you leave home, when you begin living with someone, and when you retire. So in London, Ontario, we're going to focus on the groups that are about to retire. But well, why? And their partners. So that, so that they are beginning to think, look, they're probably, the average age of retirement in Canada is 64.4 years. So they're already at a stage where somebody has had stroke, somebody's had dementia, somebody's had heart disease. They want to have a healthy retirement, so they're more motivated. And then when they retire, they'll have more time. But in order for them to abide by what we're recommending, we have to develop a simple ABC of holistic brain health. Activity and sleep, balanced diet, and connecting with others. So we're working to, to, de, to, de, to actually develop the ABC. And so I'll give you an example of how we want to go to the minimum. It turns out that the greatest benefit you get in terms of exercise is just moving. That gives you already a decrease in the likelihood you'll die early. If you manage 3,000 steps a day, the, the mortality probability goes even further. If you manage 38 steps a day, you can actually decrease your risk of dementia. If you do it with someone else, you double your chances you continue to do it. And, if, uh, and also you have the socializing, which is important. And then if you do it in greenery, you have additional benefits. So if you go in a, in, in a, if you are walking among greenery versus, in, say, in the city, your, your anxiety goes down, the blood pressure goes down, your heart rate goes down. In fact, the Japanese have a word for this, shingrin yoku, which is forest bathing. So the idea is that we develop these tools, but you also need motivation. And we have uh, Dr. William Fisher as an expert in this. So, I recommend, I, I, in terms of, of, of what's of this, so let's come back to you. What can I do now? Well, the fact that you're here tells me you're really motivated. So that's the beginning. The next motivation can be that you access whatever information is available in, on the websites of the Heart and Stroke Foundation and the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, which is good information. Uh, and then, uh, in terms of what you actually do, uh, I suggest that you pay attention to an old African proverb. It says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with someone. So that's the motivation part. Now, I want to give you a job to answer three questions for yourselves and maybe for others. Do you know the symptoms of a heart attack? Do you know the symptoms of a brain attack? Do you know your blood pressure, the actual blood pressure, the numbers, the top and the bottom one? Why do I ask you? Because if you have a heart attack or a brain attack, you won't have time to surf the internet, or you will not be able to do it.
Now, heart, the, the, the description of heart attacks is well done, and you can look that up. I'm going to explain what I mean by brain attack. There's a bit of confusion. Is it a stroke? Is it a TIA? Is it a mini stroke? So I'll define it for you, and, and, and the idea is a brain attack is a sudden loss of speech, vision, or the use of a limb. And by sudden, I mean within seconds. And, it, and if the symptoms disappear, the danger doesn't. These are emergencies. And the last question is, what is my blood pressure? Well, the chances that, that we, as individuals, will develop high blood pressure in a lifetime is 82%. And high blood pressure is the single most powerful, treatable risk factor for the big three. You know, the stroke, heart disease, and dementia. And moreover, only half the people who have high blood pressure know that they have it, or have it well controlled. So it's tremendous potential for making a difference. Now, there's an additional reason why we need to focus on integral brain health throughout the lifespan, which is what the, the World Health Organization advocates. And that is, in the knowledge-based society, in the digital age, we all have to continue to learn. And we all have to contribute for longer. So it's a now not only individual interest, but societal interest to invest in holistic brain health. And so we all need to foster integral brain health because it is the key to health, productivity, and well-being. Thank you.